Enter into a realm of fright, blacker than the darkest night. Your sanity hangs by a thread. Welcome to the House of Dread. Statistics show that over 60% of home invasions are committed by people who know the victims. This means that if you've ever had the unfortunate experience of having your house broken into, it was most likely done by someone who had been in your home before. This could have been a friend, a family member, a neighbor, or even a service provider. Enter Charles. Charles, otherwise known by his friends as Chuck, was a man of many talents. He had a million and one hustles, one of which was robbery, particularly home invasions. Chuck considered himself to be a professional thief and had a system for how he did everything. In fact, Chuck's main strategy was that he worked by day as a serviceman for a local pest control company, but his real job was stealing from unsuspecting homeowners. His job as a pest control technician gave him the perfect cover for his operation. As he entered people's homes to exterminate pests, he was also checking for valuables and vulnerabilities. Chuck was a man with natural charm and charisma, and this made it easy for him to build trust with the homeowners. He would make small talk with them while he went about his work, always wearing a friendly smile. At only five foot six, Chuck's pleasing personality combined with his relatively small stature made it easy for people to not feel threatened around him and this is part of what made his job so easy. His customers never suspected that their friendly pest control guy was actually casing their homes for a future robbery. Chuck also had a trusted team of bandits that assisted him in his crimes. The first man was named Ray. Ray was a former military man who had served in Iraq for years before being honorably discharged. His military training made him an asset to Chuck because he was skilled in reconnaissance and had a keen eye for detail. He was also an excellent driver and getaway man, making him the perfect partner for any job that required a quick escape. The second man was named Marcus. Marcus was a former boxer who had a mean left hook and was built like a tank. His strength and intimidating presence were assets to Chuck because he served as the muscle on their jobs. If things ever got out of hand, Marcus was always there to quickly put a stop to it. The third man was named Jerry. Jerry was an expert in technology and gadgets. He knew how to hack into security systems and disable alarms making it easier for the men to enter and exit homes undetected. He was also able to create custom tools that helped them to bypass certain security measures, making him an invaluable asset to their team. Together, Chuck, Ray, Marcus, and Jerry made up the perfect team of burglars each bringing their own unique strengths to the table to ensure that every job went smoothly. After casing and robbing a number of homes in the area, Chuck would resign from the company he was working for, move to a different city, get hired by another pest control company, and start the process all over again. Naturally, Chuck's team would follow him, each member taking up different occupations so they didn't raise any suspicion. Of all Chuck's crooked scams and dirty underhanded hustles, his pest control gig proved to be the most lucrative, at least for a while. 
Eventually, Chuck and his team found themselves in the southern state of Georgia. Chuck quickly secured a job with another pest control company and started his routine of providing extermination services while secretly casing homes in the local area. Everything was going according to plan until Chuck's company got an account with a family called the Brimleys. The Brimleys were a rich and powerful family whose name carried a lot of weight in their local area. They were well known for their contributions and community activism. Ted, the husband, was a successful businessman who owned a fast food franchise and had a large share of that industry in his area. Mary, the wife, was a stay-at-home mom who looked after their four beautiful children, two handsome strapping young boys and two adorable little girls. The Brimleys were always present at charity events and community gatherings, often spearheading various programs that aimed to make their neighborhood a much better place. In fact, they were heads of the local Neighborhood Watch organization that sought to keep an eye out for and to report on any suspicious activity. Chuck had caught wind of the Brimley's name and reputation shortly after he settled in Georgia. He was well aware of their power and prominence in the community. So when his pest control company put him on the account to be their service technician, he considered it to be a great opportunity. One day, while on his lunch break, Chuck ventured over to the Brimley's residence, making sure to keep a safe distance as he just wanted to get a feel for what he was in for. The Brimley's had a beautiful home, which was hard to miss considering it was nestled at the end of a quiet little cul-de-sac. Chuck couldn't help but grin as he sat in his service truck across the street from the Brimley's home, his eyes wide with greed and his heart pounding with anticipation. The house was a sprawling mansion, easily one of the largest on the block. It sat on a vast expanse of land that was just over two acres in size, with a manicured lawn that was so pristine it looked like astroturf on a football field. The house itself was an architectural marvel, with its red brick exterior and towering white columns that framed the front entrance. From where Chuck sat, he could see that the house had at least five bedrooms, including a master suite that was probably the size of most people's apartments. The house had to be at least 10,000 square feet, if not more. And all this combined with the number of luxury cars parked in the Brimley's driveway made it clear that this family was not hurting for money. Chuck's eyes scanned the windows of the house, taking note of the high-end furniture and valuable artwork that was on display. He imagined the riches that he could score if he managed to get his hands on just a fraction of what was inside that home. He was salivating at the thought of pulling off what he considered to be the ultimate score. As he watched, a car pulled up in front of the house and a woman stepped out of the driver's side. It was the wife, Mary Brimley, and she was dressed in a designer suit and heels. She walked briskly up to the house and after fumbling with her keys for a moment, she disappeared inside. Chuck could feel his heart racing as he imagined all of the valuables that must be inside that house. It was like something out of a dream. In his mind, Chuck was already planning his entry and exit strategy. He knew that breaking into a home like this wouldn't be easy, but he was confident that he and his team could pull it off. He pictured him and his team slipping past the Brimley's state-of-the-art security systems, grabbing as much loot as they could carry and disappearing into the night without a trace. The following week, it was time for Chuck's first service call to the Brimley's house. The lawn still looked pristine and the house was just as grand as he had remembered. As he got out of his truck, he was met by the husband, Ted Brimley, who had a friendly smile on his face. Ted explained that he was taking his family on a tour of Europe and that they would be gone for roughly a month, so they just wanted to make sure their home was protected while they were gone. 
As Chuck began pulling his equipment and chemicals out of the back of his truck, Ted also explained that they had never had pest problems before, but that they wanted to be proactive and have someone come in and just spray for a bit before they left. Chuck assured Ted that he would cover every square inch of the interior and that he would also spray the outside perimeter of the house. He guaranteed that Ted and his family would be bug-free. This was music to Ted's ears and he excused himself to take an important phone call while he left Chuck to work alone. Chuck walked through the Brimley's house taking note of every valuable item on display. He could hardly contain himself as he gazed upon the elegant furniture, priceless paintings, and intricate sculptures that graced every corner of the mansion. It was clear that the Brimleys spared no expense when it came to decorating their home. As Chuck made his way through the various rooms and finally the outside perimeter, he couldn't help but notice how vulnerable the house actually was. The windows were large and unguarded, offering a clear view of the lavish interior. The doors were not reinforced and Chuck knew that with the right tools, they could be easily breached. The security system was impressive, but Chuck had seen better. He was certain that he and his team could bypass it without too much trouble. Chuck continued his work, spraying every nook and cranny of the Brimley's home with his pest control chemicals. As he worked, he couldn't help but feel a sense of excitement building inside of him. This was it, the score of a lifetime. He had never seen so much wealth in one place before, and he was sure that if he could get his hands on just a fraction of it, he would be set for life. Chuck packed up his equipment, said goodbye to Ted, and made his way out of the Brimley's house, his mind racing with possibilities. He knew that the next couple of weeks were going to be tense as he and his team planned their heist, but he was ready for the challenge. This was it the ultimate score, and he was determined to make it happen. But as he drove away from the house, Chuck couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't quite right. He couldn't put his finger on it, but the house just seemed to be too perfect, too pristine, and the Brimleys themselves seemed to be almost too trusting and, and too friendly. For a brief moment, Chuck wondered if something was off, but by this time he had dollar signs in his eyes, and he wasn't about to let a little suspicion get in the way of him pulling off the biggest heist in the history of his degenerate career. About a week before the Brimleys were scheduled to return home, Chuck and his crew of bandits made their move. As Chuck suspected, they were able to bypass the Brimleys' alarm system without too much trouble. They cut the power, came in through the rear entrance of the home, and made their way silently through the first floor. Chuck and his crew quickly began filling their bags with jewelry, antique silverware, gold and silver coins, and other valuables. They were swift and coordinated like clockwork. It was pretty obvious that this was not their first rodeo. Before long, Chuck and his crew had bags bursting at the seams containing tens of thousands of dollars in stolen possessions. Their plan was to start with the smaller items and move on to the bigger things like the Brimley's expensive artwork and oil paintings. And that's where things took a downturn. When Chuck's getaway driver Ray attempted to exit the house to load the stolen valuables into their van, he was bewildered to discover that the door wouldn't open. The knob would turn, but no matter how hard he pushed, the door remained shut. Now they had all just entered through this same door a short while ago, and now it was as if someone had sealed it from the outside. How could that be? Chuck and his cronies began trying to force the door open, kicking it, ramming it with their shoulders, and using crowbars to try and pry it open but with no success. Frustration and panic began to set in as the men started arguing with each other. 
They knew they would have to find another way out and quickly. Suddenly, Chuck and his crew heard a horrifying noise that made their blood run cold. The men froze in absolute terror. The house was supposed to be empty, but apparently it wasn't. And that noise sure as hell didn't sound like it was coming from anything human. Petrified and unsure of what to do next, Chuck and his bandits all stood huddled together in the dark like a pack of scared little children. noises were coming from all around them, and they could literally feel the vibrations of those noises deep down in their bones. Chuck's mind raced as he tried to think of a way out of the situation. He knew that now they had two enemies, the police, and whatever the hell was making those horrible sounds. Still unable to exit the house the same way they came in. Chuck and his terrified crew continued arguing amongst each other as they scrambled to find another way out. Little did they know, they were never going to leave the Brimley house. The men were now in sheer panic mode. Chuck and his crew frantically searched for an escape, only to find every door and window sealed tight. Chuck knew they had to get out of there and fast. He knew it would only be a matter of time before someone heard all of the commotion and called the police. Desperate for a solution, and with every other option seemingly off the table, Chuck considered that there may be a way out through the basement. He remembered that when he first came to spray the house, Ted Brimley instructed him not to go in the basement. Chuck had wondered why that particular part of the house was off limits, but now it seemed like their only chance for survival. At first, Chuck's cronies thought he was out of his mind for even suggesting such a thing. With all the creepy and unexplained noises they were hearing, why in the hell would they want to venture down into the basement? Chuck reminded his crew that they had tried every other area of the house with no success, and the basement was their last hope of getting the hell out of there. If there was even the slightest chance of an escape, they needed to take it. And the last thing Chuck wanted was for them to end up in prison simply because they were too damn scared to go in the basement. Besides, Chuck rationalized that even if there was a serious threat in the basement, the four of them should be able to handle it without too much trouble. It was certainly the last thing any of them wanted to do, but they saw no other choice. And so, with a flashlight, a crowbar, and Ray's 9mm, they descended down the stairs into the pitch blackness. Strangely, the basement was totally unlike the rest of the house. The stairs were merely planks of wood that creaked and groaned with every step. It was an unfinished, cold, concrete tomb, completely void of all the life and vibrance that characterized the upper levels of the mansion. There was no furniture or decorations, just barren walls and a cracked cement floor. Chuck thought to himself, is this what Ted Brimley had been hiding? Why? There's absolutely nothing down here. The men cautiously navigated their way through the dark, the only light coming from Chuck's flashlight, and shadows danced on the walls as they walked. The air was damp, and it smelled musty and stale. They made their way around the perimeter of the basement, checking each wall and corner for any sign of an escape route, some hidden door or passageway, and they searched for what felt like hours, but found nothing. 
it quickly became obvious that there was no other exit. Exasperated, Chuck and his crew gave up and decided to go back upstairs. But to their horror, they discovered that both the stairway and the door had completely disappeared. The entire entrance to the basement had vanished, and now it was just a ceiling. What the hell? How could that be? The men could not believe their eyes. As Chuck and his crew stood there totally stunned, their hearts pounding in their chests, a loud noise echoed through the basement, causing the men to jolt and turn around to see where the noise was coming from. Their eyes widened in disbelief as a door that hadn't been there previously slowly opened with a haunting creak. This could not be happening. It was as if the house itself was toying with them, playing some kind of cruel game. The door revealed an empty but dimly lit room. Standing in the middle of that room was a man. He was facing the wall with his back turned to Chuck and his crew, and he merely stood there as if he had no idea that the door was open and that Chuck and his crew could see him. The man was shirtless and barefoot, with dirty and ripped pants. He looked as if he hadn't been out of that room in years. Chuck called out to the strange man, ordering him to turn around and identify himself. But Chuck had no idea what he had just asked for. The man did indeed turn around, and when he did, Chuck was horrified to find out that it was Ted Brimley, the man who was supposed to be out of the country with his family and the owner of the very house that Chuck and his miscreant friends were attempting to rob. At this point, Chuck was pissing his pants. He was totally petrified and didn't know what to do think or say. This was supposed to have been the heist that set him up for life, and all he could do now was wonder how things could have possibly gone so wrong. Chuck struggled to formulate his words as he ironically began to ask Mr. Brimley what he was doing in his own house. Ted Brimley said nothing and simply stood there with a penetrating gaze in his eyes that seemed to cut right through to Chuck's very soul. Then, a sinister smile began to slowly creep across Ted Brimley's face. He looked as if he knew something that Chuck and his crew didn't. And in fact, he did. Chuck and his men struggled to keep their composure and maintain their dominance in the standoff with Ted Brimley but they had no idea what they were in for. Ted Brimley's face began to angrily twist and contort. He was gritting his teeth and his body was shaking violently. Then he collapsed to the floor and Chuck and his crew watched in absolute horror as Ted Brimley's body began transforming into something otherworldly. Ted writhed around on the ground in excruciating pain as his limbs began to stretch and elongate. Guttural growls reverberated through the entire basement, sending shivers down the spines of Chuck and his terrified cronies. They could literally hear Ted's tendons pulling and tearing as his bones cracked and splintered just beneath the surface. His once human arms and legs contorted and twisted, growing in length and girth until they resembled the grotesque appendages of a monstrous beast. Ted screamed in agony as his bones snapped like tree branches and spurts of blood sprayed from beneath his skin. His flesh began to rip and tear and his nose grew into a menacing snout while his teeth became sharp and jagged like daggers.
as the transformation reached its apex, Chuck and his crew could only watch in horror and disbelief. Their confidence was now shattered like fragile glass, leaving them paralyzed with fear. The burglars realized they were way in over their heads and had stumbled into a nightmare far beyond their comprehension. They were mere pawns in a game they could never win, facing a creature born from the depths of darkness itself. Chuck's buddy Ray wasted no time unloading a barrage of bullets at the monstrous creature, but it was like throwing pebbles at a mountain. The beast merely laughed as the bullet holes began to close by themselves. This was it. Chuck and his crew were in deep shit. Suddenly, the creature who had been hunched over began to stand erect, revealing its imposing seven-foot stature. It let out a terrifying scream, lunged at the men and began to make short work of Chuck and his bandits. It was over in seconds. In an instant, the men had been turned into mincemeat. Chuck lay on the floor in a pool of his own blood, severely injured and unable to move or barely even speak. As the life slowly drained out of Chuck's eyes, he couldn't help but feel a sense of irony in the way things had played out. He spent his life playing the role of a pest control technician, but in the end, it was he and his degenerate friends who were the true pests. And just like the bugs he was paid to exterminate from people's homes, he himself got exterminated. If you enjoyed this presentation, please consider showing your support by liking this video and subscribing to the channel. And if you're in need of a narrator for your next project, or you just want to say hello, contact me at thehouseofdread666 at gmail.com. Until the next tale of terror, this is Victor Bloodborne. Stay dreadful.